Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I'm Eric Ajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, your one-stop website for all of today's latest church apostasy and end-time news. Now, Trad Cat Night is featured all over the alternative media circuit, and I'm doing my best to keep you up to date on all of the latest happenings from around the world as we head closer to the fruition of the third secret of Fatima. <clears throat> my good friends, please subscribe to Trad Cat Night right now on YouTube, about 145,000 strong, and in the event of... Uh, YouTube pulling down my channel, which is a possibility. We're seeing a lot of Christian and Truther channels going down. I encourage you all to visit Tradcat Night on one of the various platforms that I am seen on, whether it's Veterans Today, Minds.com, PubeTube, BitChute, Steemit, DTube. We're also on iTunes and Google Play now, as well as Player.fm. And, of course, you can find these talks on SoundCloud.com, TradcatNight.org, the sister site. And across any social media outlet, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Plus, you can find Tradcat Night material. Now, today is April 26, uh, 2018, and I have a returning guest uh, with me today. She's been on the program before we did a talk in January of 2017 covering feminism, uh, being the communist weapon against uh, the family. I have with me today Cornelia Ferrara. And uh, you should all know her from the traditional Catholic world, internationally uh, renowned researcher, author, apologist, speaker. She spent over 30 years exposing the errors of feminism, humanism, Freemasonry, communism, the occult, the new age, and new world order. And she has focused specifically, uh, especially on uh, all of the aforementioned effects on the Catholic faith and Catholic education itself. And today... We want to get into uh, a lot of different topics, whether it's talking about the Sillon movement, whether it's talking about humanism, World Youth Day, uh, this evolution from what we knew and understood to be the Catholic faith uh, to be this new hokey dokey uh, Novus Ordo faith. It's really what it is. It's being, you know, what's being taught by the Conciliar Church truly isn't Catholic, but it's still being labeled uh, Catholic. And I'm going to hand it over to Cornelia right now because I know she wants to get into uh, the Vatican's Year of the Youth, the Synod of the Youth due in October. Of course, we've got uh, World uh, Youth Day. I just recently covered an article uh, by Crux, which is a completely Novus Ordo website. And they basically, they basically liken World Youth Day to a Catholic Woodstock. I kid you not. So I'm sure John Lennon would be proud. Uh, and of course, uh, I think all of you should know that uh, what went on at Woodstock wasn't necessarily uh, the greatest of things between you know the sex and drugs and uh, all the nonsense with that. But the prelates in the church are now uh, saying that this World Youth Day coming up in January 2019 will actually be organized by the young people themselves. That's even more frightening, Cornelia, uh, cons- <laughs> considering what our youth are like in the conciliar church these days. Um, why don't you pick up from there? Tell us. Uh, what you're seeing along the line of the youth and where things are headed? Well, um, it's getting crazier by the day, not just in the church, but society in general. Uh, Youth is taking over everywhere. Um, They're being given their voices. I used to tell my children when they were quite young, like early teens, and they would say something, and I'd say, look, you were just born yesterday, you know, don't tell me about this or that. And that's that's what's happening now. These are children, uh, they have utterly no experience of life, and they're being asked to run the church, they're being asked to run society, they're the future of the church, they're told, they're the future of the world, and uh, and uh, all we're doing is descending into barbarism every day, and when you start uh, investigating who's doing what, it's youth most of the time that's causing a lot of problems. Now, how, how would you say Francis is perpetuating the problem of the, uh, the youth? I know we as traditionalists obviously see him as being the revolutionary that he is. It seems pretty adamant that he is making an open call uh, to revolution. And I, I just did a recent article, uh, it was two days ago, just identifying how this quote-unquote new Catholic really in reality on the objective level isn't uh, Catholic at all on the objective level, and they're being raised as being the New World Order citizens, you know, the future, if you will. Then we've got Francis uh, coming out. I don't know if you saw that World Youth Day poster uh, where he was praising it as being futuristic. I mean, it was obviously very modernist. And, uh, you know, there's there's just so many different ways that you can indict uh, Francis for being a revolutionary and a modernist. But 
Uh, how is Francis contributing to the problem? Well, first of all, it's this particular year. It's the year of the youth. And they will have a synod at the end of the year, a uh, synod on youth. And uh, already you can see where it's going. He had pre-synod meeting back, in, I think it was in March. Um, and then uh, they are asked to give their voices, what they want the church to do for them. Uh, basically, let them live their lives as they want to live it. Um, he is definitely encouraging them to revolution. I can give you a few quotes in a few minutes. Sure. But I want to go back, kind of put it in context. He's not acting on his own, obviously, Francis. Uh, this program goes way back to minimum of the 19th century. Right. Uh, Freemasonry. Freemasonry. Freemasonry said, uh, we have to get the children away uh, to develop their own freedom of conscience, okay? They have to be protected against the disturbing influence of parents and the church. And this is indispensable to the establishment of the universal social republic and the glorious era of human solidarity. So in other words, a.k.a. the New World Order, right. which is the sonic New World Order. So they saw way back in the 19th century, we have to get the kids. That's the only way to start working at this. And so it's been uh, more than a century, and boy, they have, they have succeeded. Uh, so Francis is basically carrying out the program, which has been in operation ever since Vatican II in any case, um, as religion was taken over by the lay people. When the uh, religious, the nuns walked out, the priests walked out, the brothers walked out, now came under the lay people, and therefore in came the influence of the Masons very easily once you got lay people running the organizations. And um, if you want to go back into some of the ways they did it at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, uh, Skull and Bones, you know, was influential at Yale University, right? Um, and Skull and Bones is uh, tied in with the Illuminati. So some Yale graduates went off to Germany and uh, they studied under Hegel and other, other German philosophers and psychologists about how to set up this new way of thinking. They brought it back, they went into education, they took over teachers' colleges, they, or they founded teachers' colleges they, in the universities. They started to bring in this thinking of Hegel, which is what? That the state is supreme, and everybody has to serve the state. The state today, of course, is just called society, or the church, or whatever you want to call it, but in the end, it's the state. So that's getting towards that one world government that's going to run the one world order. So everybody has to serve that. They could be a slave. One of the people who picked up from these Yale graduates was Dewey, John Dewey, uh, part one of the co-founders of religious humanism. And I call it religious humanism because really, although it's called secular humanism, it's a, a, it's a recognized religion. Anyhow, Dewey brought this into the whole education system. It worked its way into the Catholic Church. It worked its way into the Catholic school system. So now we're living through that revolution of going away from parents and the church. Yeah, well said. You and I both know how humanism very much uh, is a part of the problem. Obviously, since Vatican II, philosophically speaking, these conciliars are preaching this newer integral humanism, basically abandoning Thomism. Um, and, you know, I, I would always make this points when I would argue with various uh, bishops in the conciliar church or even with priests online, and I would show them websites which actually lay out all of these same principles that Freemasons teach that are found uh, in Vatican II, such as religious liberty or liberty of conscience, and going forward, you know, with the conciliar popes. And immediately I get blocked. They don't even want to try to de debate me because we can draw that connect correlation between uh, Freemasonry and this uh, counter church that we see. Uh, I want to get your commentary more on humanism uh, as it relates to uh, Freemasonry. The ultimate ends, from my perspective, Cornelia, is what Our Lady of La Salette warned of uh, in 1846 uh, when she said, Rome would lose the faith and become the seat of Antichrist. The ultimate aims of these humanists is to bring it uh, down another level, if you will, uh, to wherein they'll have a church free of dogma altogether. Um, and I, I wanted to get your, your commentary on that and also talk a little bit more about the education uh, system. We, I recently had on Charlotte Isabit this past weekend. She's oh, an, 
Yeah, she's a traditional Catholic, uh, and we talked about this, how, you know, there's just an overall dumbing down of society, creating this docile citizen of the New World Order. We're always being told, obey, obey, obey. And here you have people in the conciliar church, uh, Cornelia, who think that it's not even possible for church men to be in apostasy. And this is the first step to actually being a part of that apostasy, <laughs> if you don't think it's possible. <laughs> right. Well, you see, John Dewey, uh, as I said, he studied the system that came from Hegel and other Germans. And the education, the goal of education became a tool for social change, to fit the child into being a nice, docile citizen of this new, absolute world state. And he actually taught that genuine ignorance, this is a quotation, genuine ignorance is profitable because it is likely to be accompanied by open-mindedness. So you see, that's the dumbing down of the education. Then you can tell people whatever you want. If they don't know history, geography, uh, religion, uh, anything of the past, you can make up any stories you want, say anything you want, that's an open-minded person will then believe you. And that's what we have by dumbing down the education system. And it's happening in the church. Today's generation, young people, I would say 40 and under, and even a lot older than that, know nothing about the history of the church. Some of them don't even think the church began until Vatican II. They, they are that ignorant of the history of the church. So you can tell them anything you want, and they'll believe you. <laughs> yeah, well said. And, uh, you know, just. Especially, sorry, especially if it appeals to them. And that's what Freemason we said. Leo the 13th, in his encyclical on Freemasonry, brought it out very clearly how they were going after the youth, giving them a license to do anything they wanted. And once you give them that license to do anything you wanted, they're under your control. And they, they, they have weak wills. You know, he called them a soft and pliant age. He said Freemasonry wants to mold the youth through education. He said the same thing, through education, because they're soft and pliant. And they will bend them whether they want and raise them according to their goal, which is socialism in the New World Order. So our hopes have spoken about this year, the 30. Uh, Pius X had to stop the movement that started at the start of the 20th century, the Sion movement. I think you mentioned that in your introduction. The Sion movement was a model of what we are undergoing now. They started it back then to appeal to the youth. To the young seminarians, to the young priests, they wanted to start forming the One World Order. Pius X even said they wanted to move towards a One World Religion. Pius X used that phrase back in about 1902, 3, 4, somewhere in the early part yes. of the 20th century. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Pope St. Pius X, yeah, I put that encyclical out quite often. I mean, it very obviously is describing what's happening in the church today. Um, he also described these false Catholics. And again, you know, people want to label me for being uncharitable or whatever. But on the objective level, since Vatican II, people following Vatican II, they're simply false Catholics uh, on the surface level. He called them the, these new apostles who have the audacity to call themselves Catholic. Now, I know you also point out that John the Twenty-Third was a self-admitted uh, Siliana. So I want you to talk about that. But, I, you know, just in general, uh, Cornelia, I can always speak for myself. You know, I run into an awful lot of people coming from all different kinds of angles. But just with people who are following Vatican II, they obviously don't know church history. But if they do get a quote or some piece for from a pre-conciliar, uh, you know, pre-Vatican II document, they'll always just fall upon, well, this is what the church tells us now. This is what Francis tells us now. This is what my local bishop tells us now. They don't understand the difference between true and false obedience, and they're continuing to tote that parting line as lemmings falling off the Novus Ordo cliff. And what they don't understand is you cannot change doctrine. You cannot change morality. But this is what's been preached since Vatican II. And one of the great persons to, uh, to show that you can change if you want to change is Benedict, Pope Benedict, who, you know, brought up this hermeneutic of continuity, which said basically, oh, yeah, 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 we don't change the principles, but we have to change, you know, how we put them into practice in changing circumstances and new historical situations and all. So they're very clever. We're not changing anything of the principles, but of course we 
changing the principle. So they say that divorce, you don't even bother to call divorce and remarriage adultery, which is a mortal sin, and say you can therefore go to communion. Of course you're changing principles, only you haven't put out a written document saying that, that this can be done and this is not the way of the church and everybody has to believe it and this is my new infallible statement. You know what I mean? But of course they're changing it in practice. And people don't see this and they go with the false obedience. Instead of saying, these guys are revolutionaries. But if you don't know history, if you don't know what Vatican I taught, if you don't know what all the pre-Vatican II popes taught, you don't see that things are being changed. So naturally you're going to say, well, of course I have to be whoever's there right now. Yeah, no doubt about it. And for those who want uh, further proof to this, it was just recently that we had uh, Cardinal Casper saying that Protestants and Catholic are part of the one church. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I've been saying that for a while, for a while, that they're part of the one church. I mean, that started from Vatican II. Right. It's well, you know, where they have the, what is the, what is the place, subsist in the Catholic church. Yes. Meaning that all Protestants think this, Catholic Church now. You see, uh, I don't even know where to begin with all of this. There's so much to talk about. No, I know. It's also in Vatican II where it talks about Protestant sex being a means of salvation, which is also heretical yeah. as well. It ties in with what we're talking about uh, yeah. with Cornelia. So uh, I didn't want to cut you off. Go ahead and, and, and follow up what you wanted to say. I just wanted to add that I just recently put out a, a video from Father Malachi Martin just talking about how the conciliar church is an illusion, that people are being you know, led astray into a, a, another faith, this Novus Ordo faith, while it's still being uh, labeled Catholic. I encourage you all to listen to that video. Go ahead, Cornelia, uh, pick well, up. See, this is this is part of the plan. This is the whole part of the plan. Um, the church has to serve. Now, you know Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey was the right. uh, big writer in the 20th century, giving us the plan for the Masonic World Order and how it has to be put into action. And... Um, Looking up. By the way, a lot of what I have to say, the big details, is in the book that I wrote with John Renari called World Youth Day from Catholicism to Counter Church. That's where we are. We have gone from true Catholicism, as you've been saying, into really what is a counter church. And uh, World Youth Day is part of how to do it. And yeah, getting back to um, Alice Bailey, she said, um, let me get this up in my book over here. She said, how is the church to serve Masonic occultists? Is that what you mean? Um, she says, the guides of our evolution recognize that for the general public, it is the form which matters to them the most, for they are conservative and cling to the familiar. But nevertheless, the church is intended to serve the masses and is not intended to be of use except as a field of service to the occultists. And how, she said, the Christian Church, now notice that one Christian, you see, that includes the Catholic Church these days. Right. The Christian Church, in its many branches, can serve as a Saint John the Baptist, and I say that as a precursor for Antichrist, and as a nucleus through which world illumination may be accomplished. Illumination means brainwashing, getting people to think differently from how they thought before, okay? That's called illumination. So the work of this Christian church, it's intended to be the building of a broad platform. The church must show a wide tolerance and teach no revolutionary doctrines or cling to any reactionary ideas. That is, don't cling to tradition. The prime work of the church is preserving the outer appearance in order to reach the many who are accustomed to church usages. So keep the outer appearances. We have seven sacraments, right. we have a mass, we have the Vatican, we have a Pope, bishops, hierarchy. These are all the outer things. But change the meaning of everything inside. And get the people to accept those changes. That's called illumination. Get the people. So what have they accepted now? That now the church can be run by lay people, right down to the youth. Lay people, this is a big change. Talk of collegiality of Pope and bishops, bishops and bishops. This is now Pope, bishops, lay people right down to the youth. That's a new form of collegiality today. 
Yeah, and like I mentioned, uh, it's part in ignorance. I've had actually a lot of people who claim to be Masons over the years come to me and say, you know, I was once a Mason. What Vatican II teach, you know, teaches isn't Freemasonry. And then I ask them, okay, well, you tell me as an ex-Freemason, what are the principles of Freemason? And then I get dead silence or they just leave because I know I've caught them in a trap because I can prove very easily from uh, Freemasonic documents themselves how what they are teaching corresponds to what Vatican II is teaching. So they always will run away from me. Uh, after that point. And uh, I wanted to get uh, your take on this, if I could. You mentioned that there are a lot of change agent programs in the conciliar church. And coincidentally, uh, for those who missed this, we, we now have Homo Week being celebrated at a purported Catholic university in Mexico under the title of Human Diversity Week. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. This is that, that comes that comes all the gender problems now, you see. <laughs> Diversity. Yeah, they, they, they got their words down pat, and if they need to change their words, they will change their words. But obviously this is changing Catholic morality, and changing Catholic, you can't separate morality from doctrine of the faith, because one side of the coin is the faith and the doctrine, and the other side is morality. You can't separate them. And so uh, <clears throat> this is where they're hitting the youth. World Youth Day, you mentioned, World Youth Day is a major change agent program. And it was started by John Paul, of course. And uh, it's wonderful, as you can see from a lot that has been written about it and in my book, World Youth Day. It shows not just what goes on at World Youth Day, which is totally revolutionary children, um, young people living in tents by themselves overnight, and you know what goes on over there, and, and the whole, I don't know, uncivilized way of behaving. All this is completely uncatholic, naturally, <clears throat> morally as well. And so it's a revolutionary change program, along with things like the new movements, like Focolare, neo catholic Human Way, RCIA, anything that will get kids and people away from tradition, anything. And they just keep on every day coming up with something new. It's so hard to keep up with it. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, I've been warning people. I'm firmly committed to thinking that this Maitreya character very much is the Antichrist. That's his general name attributed to him. I don't know. You know, I don't think he's any world leader that we see right now, but it's very clear in his writings that he's got this false prophet uh, character who will arrive in Rome shortly, who will install a whole other new program i mean it'll be another like if you think the vatican two doubtful sacraments are bad just wait till they in, in, uh, install this seven step self-realization program and the reason why we're bringing this up is cornelia also studies you know the new age movement one of one of which is going to be the mark of the beast this counterfeit uh baptism so if you think it's bad with francis i always tell people that we, we've not really seen anything yet and uh cornelia had mentioned you know the state indoctrination basically we, they have to get people to see the state as the solution as opposed to you know parents or the church or whatnot but we had that recent situation with francis basically saying uh you know cardinal zen basically being undermined over there in china i'm sure you saw that uh cornelia and you know basically sponsoring or getting behind the state-run bishops of china as opposed to the actual purported real catholic bishops uh in china so we kind of obviously see uh where that's going Mike, oh. go ahead. No, no, I, I, think I agree with you, yes. It's, uh, it's, a, it's again, the support. And that's been building for a while, not just under Francis. They've been moving towards that right. for a while, you know, to, to recognize the uh, basically communist state church. Yeah, and I also wanted to add, too, John Paul II was uh, very much an Illuminist. He, he read the writings and supported the writings of Teshar Dan. So, again, the, you know, I've always argued this, too, uh, Cornelia, because with the false traditionals, that's what the label that I give them, they always just want to see Francis and a few of these uh, way more liberal um, cardinals as being the problem when they don't realize they're a part of the problem for following Vatican II. You and I both know that this was, you know, this has been in place now for well over 50 years now. Um, how how do we try to get all traditionalists basically on the same same page? Is that a possibility? Do you, do you, do you think there can be some sort of coming together of most traditionalists at this point, or do you see it just kind of following the the same line that you know most people will, will probably just see Francis as the problem and not Vatican too? Well, the traditionalists started getting weak when Benedict was elected. 
They went, oh, yeah, Benedict, oh, wow, Rhapsody, you're fantastic. But I was saying, excuse me, Rhapsody is an out-and-out liberal. I mean, he was following Vatican II up to this day. He is Vatican II and nothing else but Vatican II. But he's a very clever dialectician. Francis is more open. He couldn't care less about dialectics. Benedict was a dialectician. You know, your synthesis or thesis and antithesis, one step forward, two steps backward, going this way, going that way. When he gave us the motu uh, proprio, when he gave us the Samorum Pontificum, oh, that absolutely made all the, all the traditionals fall into his camp, you know. But a few days later, just a few days later, he was talking to some priests in Italy. And one of them was quite perturbed that the church was now going backwards. That's why Benedict brought in his hermeneutic of continuity, to show, no, 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 we're not going backwards, we're still continuing with Vatican II, don't bother about it, we're just, you know, fine-tuning things a little bit according to the new historical situation. So he, he told his priests, no, 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 we are not going backwards, we are on this road forwards. So he is Vatican II without a doubt. He intends, by the way, and he intended, there was a letter that came out accompanying Samara Pontificum in which he made it very clear that at some stage the two masses, Novus Ordo and the traditional mass, will have to be combined in some form or another. It might happen fairly soon. I don't know. There's rumors about it. But uh, he intends that there's going to be a synthesis at some stage. He is a master dialectician. Anyhow, the traditionalists got wrapped up with Benedict. And now here comes Francis doing taking the program forward along this road that Benedict said we have to continue on this road forwards, always going forwards, evolutionary, always going forwards. You just change things a little bit, you modify a little bit, if you need to go a bit, look like you're going backwards, do that, but always go forwards. That's a communist technique, right? In the one step forward, two steps backwards. Always going forward. And that's all Francis is doing. He's taking the program forwards. For whatever reason, Benedict didn't want to do it. Francis is doing it. And the guy who comes after him, God help us, I don't know what's going to happen next. But in the end, we have to go to an unrecognizable church. You're either going to belong to this kind of church, or you're going to go underground with a few priests here and there who will accompany the poor lay people who are left, you know, the few people. Yeah, no question. No question about it. Yeah, the New World Order was officially supported by John Paul II and Benedict XVI. You can even just Google that into to YouTube, and you'll see how they have had open support for the New World Order. So, yes, it's it's long happened before Benedict uh, the XVI, if you will. Uh, in my opinion, yeah, the church is going underground. The next step, according to the New World Order plan, is to have someone arrive onto the scene who will be seen as a pope but won't want to be called Pope, who, in my opinion, will be this biblical false prophet who will install this new seven phony, uh, you know, invalid uh, self, uh, self-realization self program uh, in Rome after, in my opinion, I think Benedict will, like, step to the side or, or something along those lines. Um, I wanted to get your take on what. how do you think 2018 will play out uh, in terms of what, we're, you know, we're obviously seeing from Francis. I don't know if you got any commentary on Francis's latest apostolic letter, which basically every traditionalist was up in arms about, a call to holiness, which I labeled a call to baloniness, because <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just more cult of man rhetoric. I haven't read it quite frankly. Still have time to read all this nonsense. Yeah, do yourself a favor and don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can just listen to what he says. For instance, the call to revolution. I call it the call to revolution. Remember the call to action many, many years ago, many, many years ago, I think that was Bernadine and, and so on, the call to action. All this is continuing the call to action, the call to revolution for the youth. I mean, when he told them, um, you guys have not been listening to for a long time, you don't keep silent, don't worry about keep silent, shout out, say what you want, tell us what you want. And he's talking to people that he called in there, not just Catholic youth, but uh, pagans, atheists, uh, people from other Christian denominations, and he's telling them, you know, shout it out, guys, shout it out. And they say, oh, yeah, we'll shout it out. He says, uh, if we all the people and leaders sound corrupt, see how he's hitting, how he's hitting his own people, keep quiet, 
if the whole keep quiet, whole world keep quiet, will you cry out? And they say, yes, of course we will. This temptation to silence, he said, silencing the young people. And he was encouraging them to revolution. He told them, uh, don't go back, don't go backwards, he said, always go forwards, it is always, it, don't ever say, it has always been done like this, see how he hits tradition, see the creative ways in which they hit tradition. Don't say it's always been done like this. Let's do it the new way now today, you know. He says, as if you say, it's always been done like this. He says, that phrase is sweet poison. It leaves you an anesthetized and you cannot walk. What does he mean by walk? He means you cannot rebel. You cannot join a revolution if you say, oh yeah, well, it's always been done like this. You know, so he's telling them, get out of tradition. That way is is dumbing you down. It's anesthetizing you. You have to go forward in this revolution. Well, boy, oh boy, I don't think any communist could have done that better, quite frankly, or Hitler. Yeah, I wanted to get your commentary on this. I, I wanted to uh, know if you had, um, you know, ever run into Archbishop Lefebvre, what you thought about him. I, I think most real traditionalists at this point kind of use him more or less as a foundational model for, you know, our position, basically. And we talked about a weakening of the quote-unquote traditionalist movement, if you will. And I, I'm always attacked by these false traditionalists. Uh, I just kind of call them wishy washies. You know, websites like One Peter Five. I actually went to school at Steve Skocek, uh, oh. graduated with him, and we've been going at it back and forth. And I just pointed out, even this past uh, three days, he had an article in which he was purporting Archbishop Sample out in, in Portland, telling everyone to go to his mass and how, you know, he was a traditionalist. So I just pointed out concretely how this particular prelate doesn't even stand up against uh, Francis's latest apostolic. Uh, exhortation. He also considered himself, now this is a direct quote from Archbishop Sample, I am completely a product of the Second Vatican Council. That period of renewal in the church is part of who I am. So what I'm saying is these false traditionalists constitute the false right, uh, if you will. They're, they're not true traditionalists. They're not really restoring uh, tradition because you can't stand behind the council and be standing behind these particular prelates when they're not keeping the faith. And that's my, So my, my question to you is is, you know, what was, you know, if you had a relationship with Archbishop Lefebvre, if you got to know him, and then also, humanly speaking, is it possible to save the church, or do you believe it's it's only going to come through the hands of God in terms of a chastisement in which we'll basically, you know, have to correct what we're seeing now uh, in the church? Yes, it has to come through God. I don't think there's any human being that can do anything about this now, because this church itself has been totally corrupted from the top down. I mean, not a single bishop out there will go against Vatican II. And last year was another was another uh, uh, fishing in of traditionalists with that whole that, uh, Fatima stuff last year from Cardinal Burke. I think you posted some of my stuff on your website. Cardinal Burke talking about Fatima. Oh, yes, we have to do the consecration exactly as us, in spite of the fact that, you know, John Paul did it, and that was okay. <laughs> Quoted Vatican II, and then he said the Fatima message is to bring about the new evangelization. But he had the traditionalists eating out of his hand, and they will not go back on it. My article on Burke was not published by Catholic Family News. This was after John Minari died. They refused to take it. I can't get, you know, I, I only can go on to other people. Like wait, wait, say that again, Cornelia. Uh, Catholic Family News wouldn't publish that article. Is that yeah, what you said? Yeah, that's after John Minari died. Yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me. That, that's yes, my yes, point, yes. yeah. I mean, they've gone the same route of supporting Burke and rah, 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 rah behind these. I call these cardinals who are now speaking out and pretending to be traditionalists. They may, even, they may even offer a traditional mass somewhere. Wow. But their thinking is Vatican II all the way. They will not say Vatican II was anything wrong with Vatican II. I call them controlled opposition yeah that's exactly it well said and i would say at this point i'm going to throw it out there and i'm speaking for myself not cornelia but the you know there's a division now in the fatima center the canadian version i would say is controlled opposition you've got cfn controlled opposition i'll throw remnant in there as well the neo sspx and one peter five and that's why i keep telling people if you really want to follow what archbishop lefebvre and father has truly said you're you're staying at trad cat night because i'm truly uh maintaining uh that position and, and it's sad but 
it's just kind of the reality uh, that we're in, uh, Cornelia. Uh, feel free to elaborate more on that if you'd like, but I'd like to get to another question if I could, or your analysis in terms of what we may potentially see maybe by year's end 2019. Do you think that there's a possibility that we see quote unquote women deacons, maybe even women priests? Uh, there's obviously more of a call, uh, to an end of priestly celibacy in the Latin church. There were some more German bishops, uh, the other day reported, uh, saying that, and then also they're, they're, they're a part of the whole intercommunion uh, nonsense as well. I think a lot of people are, I don't know if it's shock, but when you kind of go into shock mode, like you don't honestly want to believe what's happening, like what's happening before your eyes. It's kind of like seeing your wife or husband cheating on you. It's like, did that just really happen? They're like a lot of people are in shock now over what's happening, uh, you know, before their eyes. What, what do you think is going to play out over the next year or so? Well, uh, they've been working on women deaconesses for decades now, and not just on the Francis. Uh, so we very well, now I, this is very interesting. I found out several years ago, or maybe 10 or more years ago, um, I uh, was contacted by a lady further out west in Canada because I had been talking about this women deaconesses bit, and she said uh, where she was, the women were whose husbands, you know, these these uh, permanent deacons, the lay people who become deacons, she said, when these husbands go to get the training for the deacons, the wives also go with them. They get the exact same training. In other words, they're ready to take over tomorrow if you want women deaconesses. Now, this was said, I'm telling you, at least 10 or 15 years ago. So they've been working at this for a long time. So don't be surprised if, if we get that. Not with this pope, with the next pope. You know, each pope does so much, and then he he passes it over to the next guy. So yeah, it, it it'll probably happen at some stage. But the interesting thing is now I'm trying to remember this. I read so much stuff that sometimes uh, I forget who said what. But um, I think it was the Ratzinger Forum, the Ratzinger Society. They give out a prize every year to two or three people. And uh, one of the people, I think it was that, uh, he is known to be talking about women cardinals. They're talking now about women cardinals. And this is very interesting. Mm. You have to go back and check. And I have to go back and do some more research on this. But I did learn some time ago that in order to be a cardinal, you do not have to be a priest or a bishop. I think a layman can be made a cardinal. I'll have to check, and you'll have to check on this. If that is so, and if you make a lay woman a cardinal, without her even having gone through all these other steps. No, no, it's true, yeah. Can you imagine that they could then be used to elect the next pope? <laughs> no, no, yeah, there was a German uh, bishop who actually came out and said, or it was one of Francis's theologians who said that we there is a possibility that we might have a woman pope uh, in the future. So, yeah, that, that could be like kind of a loophole for the modernists to... You know, get you know, get get a woman in as a cardinal, then you know, obviously take the next step after that. So, don't be surprised by anything you see in the next you know five to ten years, really. Yes, and you know, I just want to get back to what we started with with the youth, you know, and uh, scripture. Scripture warns about if you give the let the youth take over, you know. Um, for instance, I think uh, Isaiah said, if you want young in positions of power. I will give children to be their princes, and weak, effeminate ones shall rule over them. The young shall rise up against the old, and the dishonorable against the honorable. Are we not seeing that now? Yeah, it, it's sad. It's sad. We got to continue to pray, though. We got to continue to pray, you know, for the Pope, for prelates, for priests, souls in purgatory, for poor sinners like you and I. Obviously, that includes. Uh, the youth and I, you know, I graduated from Franciscan uh, University, undergrad, graduate, and when I go up there, like my st my stomach turns just seeing these these kids because I know they're being led astray. Most of them, they just they're really clueless. You know, I try to help when I can uh, for individuals who stop and will listen, but uh, it's it's truly sad times, uh, Cornelia. And I just want to thank you once again for coming on. I want to allow you the last uh, minute or so here to do some shameless self promotion in terms of. Uh, Upcoming articles, projects, media appearances. Uh, also, you can pitch the book that you referred to earlier. Um, well, um, oh, well, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, and the, uh, the book is called World Youth Day from Catholicism to Counter Church. And it's a big summary of exactly what we're talking about, how it got into the Church of Vatican II, the Sion movement, movements like Focolare, Neo Catechumen movement, how Dewey's educational thinking got into the Catholic Church itself, how it's uh, everything that we've just spoken about, basically. If you read that, and the Masonic, it's got the Masonic plan, uh, it's got the Illuminati plan, and it shows how it's all being worked out, and World Youth Day is part of that working out. So, uh, if you want a real summary of what's going on, I suggest if you want to get this book, World Youth Day, it's available at canisiusbooks.com on the internet. That's C A N I S I U S, like Peter Canisius, canisiusbooks.com. And I've got articles on there also that will be helpful. So, uh, Maybe if people are interested. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Cornelia. Hang tight for a second. I want to talk to you off air here briefly uh, about potentially another opportunity here in the, the next upcoming month for a talk. Uh, but I just want to thank you all for tuning in to Trad Cat Night Radio today. Check in to tradcatnight.blogspot.com daily. It's updated daily. Again, if you're truly following the Archbishop Lefebvre, Father has position. It's found here. It's not found on the false right websites now. They've moved in a completely different uh way they think cardinal burke and cardinal sarah are basically the champions of the faith at this point when archbishop of made it very clear that they were poisonous they weren't keeping the faith um so i ask you all to continue to keep me in prayer folks this is an information war so i ask for those prayers but then also if you can click that paypal button get behind this apostolate financially as we uh continue to grow um, i'll continue to spread that message of fatima and obviously keep that archbishop uh, Lefebvre position maintained uh, tomorrow my guest has actually canceled on me this morning so this is going to be a talk which I'll keep posted throughout the weekend so uh, continue to, to tune into Trad Cat Night Radio again the live call in shows are 7 to 10 p.m. on the weekends uh, late second here Max Egon called out on me he's he's very sick he's he's out there in Holland I want to say and he's not going to be able to make the talk uh, on the 29th, so uh, I've got another uh, fill-in. Peter McCarthy will be joining me from Creepy Little Book. We'll be talking about Illuminati, New World Order, things like that. Uh, but the bottom line is, tune in, folks, uh, 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern. This is an opportunity for you to call in live and have your voice heard. So I just want to thank you all for tuning in to Trad Cat Night Radio today. And until next time, stay safe and God bless. <laughs>